Well, hello. This is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We like to uh, carve out of the testable content smaller 15 minute uh, or so. That's the target, 15 minutes. Let me just check my timer here of uh, concepts that are highly probable to be encountered on your exam and in an ideal situation, more than one exam. Anti-money laundering is certainly one of those. You're going to encounter anti-money laundering on the SIE. You're going to encounter uh, less likely on seven, but possible. High probability, you're going to encounter red flags uh, on uh, 65 and 66, those two NASA exams. And you're certainly going to encounter on series 10 and 24, the idea of the WSPs having a section as well as an AML test and an AML officer. So uh, we've hit all those things we're looking for in these little 15 minute uh, lectures. So let's get started. Let me get our deck here. Let me get our annotation tool. So all broker dealers are required to have written supervisory procedures of the broker dealer. You know, there's a lot of test questions, 10s and 24s about the written supervisory procedures of the broker dealer. And I'm thinking about doing another 15 minute carve out just on WSPs and what's in there, you know, cybersecurity, that kind of stuff. Every new hire of the broker dealer has to read the written supervisory procedures and sign acknowledging that they've read them and understood them. That way we don't encounter an uh, associated person who's, well, I never knew that, you know, it wasn't on my test. We take that out of their employee file, say, isn't that your signature? This is where you acknowledge that you understood this. You know, for example, there's got to be a section on insider trading. Again, like anti-money laundering, not how to, but to prevent it, right? So all the firms are going to have to appoint L broker dealers an AML officer. I had a, a friend of mine, he called me up. He said, hey, Dean, why did you come out of retirement? And uh, I need an a AML officer, and it could be you. And he said, you know, I understand you're going to have to retest because you've been in retirement and your registrations have lapsed. And, and so, you know, I make sure that's reflected in your potential compensation. I said, well, you know, uh, not that I'm going to do it. I'm not. But if I was, an AML officer does not, surprisingly enough, to have to have a registration. If we're a broker-dealer, we want to hire an AML officer from a consulting firm or from a bank or some other financial institution and they're not registered. I can't imagine we wouldn't as a house kind of do, uh, do that, but it's no requirement. As I said, I wouldn't have to uh, be re-registered in terms of passing exams. I would have to, you know, do the U4 and all that stuff. So AML officers, no prerequisite in terms of registrations. Um, we have to have an annual AML test. You know, I told him, by the way, could be a problem, is a problem, never be a problem. You know, so I don't become your AML officer. I'm not going to have a problem. So thanks. No, thanks. I'm enjoying retirement here in Las Vegas. Uh, we have to conduct an annual AML test. Uh, that's going to be conducted by a third party, somebody independent of the uh, broker dealer. Uh, the Patriot Act. Now, I, I kind of don't like that we call it the Patriot Act because it makes it sound like if you have any kind of a problem with it, perhaps you're not a patriot. But the Patriot Act requires us to uh, verify that you are who you claim to be. And so the thing that requires us to have is a picture ID. And this uh, customer identification program required by the Patriot Act has to be integrated into our AML program. And the AML pro program is part of the Bank Secrecy Act. Now, I would definitely know this SIE test takers that the Bank Secrecy Act is what allows banks to give uh, my financial invitation information to what's called FinCEN. That's where we're heading. I would definitely know that's the Bank Secrecy Act. That's the CTRs and the SARs that can be filed with FinCEN. And that's what gives the bank or financial institution the ability to do that uh, without your permission. Uh, we have to have procedures to close the account if we're unable to identify the uh, customer. The Office of the Foreign Asset Control is part of the US Treasury. And the Office of Foreign Asset Control administers and enforces economic and trade sanctions based on US foreign policy and national security. Uh, this is, I'm coming to you, uh, you know, February of 2022. 
And right now they're talking about the uh, package of potential trade uh, sanctions on both this particular country and the uh, nationals of this country. I am required as a financial institution when opening the account to verify that that person is not a specially designated nationalist, somebody that we're not supposed to be doing business with because they are under current trade sanctions uh, for foreign policy or national securities reasons. Three stage of money laundering, very testable. Then the first stage is placement. And sometimes on the exam, they'll ask you, what is the easiest stage to intervene or prevent money laundering? And it's in the placement stage. The placement stage is the easiest stage to prevent money laundering. So placement means I need to have somewhere to put my dirty money. Remember, this is not how to, it's anti-money laundering and recognizing uh, potential placement. You know, I was reading the story about a guy who was giving the parking meters at the uh, Port Authority. And I was kind of laughing. I thought, well, how much could he, you know, steal? It ended up being lots of money. <laughs> he got caught because the uh, bank filed a suspicious activity report on uh, him depositing two tons worth of quarters. Now, this guy obviously had missed the first stage of money laundering, which is placement. You know, what he should have thought about is I've got to come up with some explanation about why I've got these quarters and where I can put these dirty quarters. You know, if I were his money laundering, uh, oh, I don't know, the equivalent of, um, what's the guy's name, Marty and Ozark or the Bird family or, you know, the wife and Breaking Bad. She bought a car wash, you know, um, Marty bought a, a town, the Ozarks, I would have suggested to him buying a vending machine company, right? Then he has an explanation about why he's got the quarters. And then the next stage would be to mix the dirty money with the clean money. That's called layering. And then at the end, we've arrived from the money launderer's perspective at the destination, which is integration. You can no longer tell the dirty money from the clean money. You know, uh, I was reading where the uh, guy was trying to money launder hundreds of millions of dollars, and his idea was to uh, fund a studio in Hollywood. Boy, that's not a bad place for the first stage of money laundering. You know, uh, <laughs> made some movies. He makes his dirty money with clean money and, you know, uh, didn't quite make it through the whole process, but he got close. So uh, FinCEN is where we uh, fi file these uh, currency transaction reports in SARS. And uh, I would know that. And then again, I would definitely know the Bank Secrecy Act, uh, SIE test takers. It was gives the financial institution the authority legally to send these things to FinCEN without you know, your permission. Uh, I was buying a uh, Harley Davidson uh, Road King. It was a silver anniversary Road King. This was years ago. And the bike was like $21,000. And I was going to give the guy the check. And he said, Dean, this bike does not leave the lot with a check. That's why you can verify funds. He said, doesn't leave with a check. I don't care if they tell me the funds are there or not. So I went to my financial institution. I got him a cashier's check for the $21,000 and gave him the uh, check and, you know, wrote off on my Harley Road King. I then a few days later, I got a copy of the CTR that he'd sent to FinCEN saying that Dean had came come into his uh, lot, his Harley dealership and paid $21,000 in cash for a Harley Road King. Now, I would debate whether that cashier's check is a currency transaction, but, you know, it's, you know, I can see why he would file it because who knows, maybe people have laundered money uh, using Harleys. That uh, CTR is for 10000 or more. I would know that and needs to be filed within 15 days. Now, if he uh, had told me or somehow accidentally let it slip that he was going to file a CTR and Dean now comes back with three uh, checks for uh, $7,000, that might trigger a suspicious activity report. You know, structuring is where, you know, I'm trying to avoid triggering the CTR. You know, it's kind of odd. Why would Dean come back with three for seven instead of, you know, just one for 21? It doesn't make really economic sense, right? And this is for 5,000 or more within 30 calendar days. You know, I'm, I'm coming to you from Vegas. I'm an old school guy. I'd like to carry lots of cash around with me and, you know, what, $100 bills. And when I go to my bank to get money, I typically get $4,000. <laughs> I don't want to trigger anything. There's nothing suspicious about where my money came from. But, you know, again, could be a problem. Is a problem, never be a problem. So, you know, uh, avoid triggering that. Uh, these are five-year records. So I wouldn't worry about that as a SIE or 765-66, but as 10s and 24s, 
they do get a little more in the weeds about record retention of a broker dealer and whether it's lifetime six, three, four, two. And this one's kind of an odd one because it's five. It's five year record retention. So here are some red flags of money laundering. So I gave you the example of structuring. Structuring is when it looks like I'm trying to avoid triggering the CTR by perhaps splitting up my banking activity in smaller uh, chunks. So that's called structuring. I gave you an example of that as a red flag. A, another red flag would be source of funds. You know, where are these funds coming from? You know, is there any explanation about where these monies are coming from? You know, do they come from a uh, location which may be suspect? You know, Belize, the Caymans, you know, uh, Monaco, there's a lot of legitimate business activities taking places in those locations, but they do have a reputation. And, you know, that might be odd if all of a sudden there's a wire that, you know, hits for a lot of money from some uh, place that uh, sounds a little odd. Are the transactions commercially illogical? You know, commercially illogical. For example, uh, Michael Cohen uh, opened a LLC, brand new LLC. He got an excess equity line of credit, and then he uh, funded the LLC, and then he wired, uh, I think it was $200,000 off to Stormy, I think, or whatever it was. And First Republic said that's commercially illogical, and they filed a suspicious activity report on uh, uh, Michael. Now, P.S., you cannot tell the customer you filed that. So let's just uh, make a note here. Let me get a different color. We make no disclosure to customers of filings thing. I'm not supposed to say, ooh, is your life about to get exciting? Uh, no care for the economic consequences of money. No uh, cares about economics. You know, uh, I told you that one of the guys had founded a movie studio in Hollywood to uh, launder money. And he remember this idea about layering. He then hired Martin Scorsese to make a film and uh, him and Leonardo DiCaprio made the film. And in making the film, you know, uh, even Leonardo and, uh, you know, Martin Scorsese, who are not, you know, financial institutions, thought, wow, this is crazy. This guy doesn't care how much the movie costs or, you know, the budget. <laughs> From their perspective, that's wonderful, right? <laughs> but it takes game to recognize the game. One of the guys who was involved said, I, I, can't, I understand the game and you are not legit. I, you know, that's my my thoughts based on having been a former uh, uh, money launderer myself. Anyways, uh, he uh, paid, I think it was Britney Spears, like $10 million to come sing happy birthday to him. Now that would be different if it's, you know, the founder of uh, Blackstone who paid the Rolling Stones six figures to come sing happy birthday to him. You know, he's a billionaire, but we do know his source of funds. So there's no doubt where his money comes from. In this case, where's that money coming from? Twofold, right? Source of funds. And then, you know, this idea that uh, doesn't really care about the economics. All right. So uh, I think we've uh, found in this little 15-minute uh, lecture uh, a couple points for everybody uh, that you might pick up on your exam. So uh, let me go there. Boom. And uh, like I say, uh, like, uh, subscribe, and I hope to see you on a uh, Tuesday upload. We upload Tuesdays at 3 p.m., I'm usually there 15 minutes before the upload uh, to run a live Q&A chat because those, uh, those uploads in really abruptly in terms of the premiere and the chat. You don't have to be chatting about the premiere. You could be bringing any question you got about anything. Uh, so, And then after that, it goes into the, the queue and it'll be in the playlist as a regular video. Okay, uh, like, share, subscribe, and I hope to see you for the next one.